Thank you, thank you very much. And I'll just put my PowerPoint up now so you can see it, and we'll dive right in. Yeah. So let's see. See there we go. I hope you can still hear me. Yes. Um, okay. So, okay, the topic is the Anthropocene uh, Global Change in Your System. Uh, of course, it is a very big complex. So, I'm going to start it out and show you what it's like here. So, um, this is a photograph of Canberra International Airport. It was taken about three hours ago, so about three and a half hours ago. Four o'clock today. Uh, the airport is closed. Uh, so that should be middle of the afternoon on a very bright summer day. Uh, it actually looks like there's one stranded Qantas aircraft which can't take off because the airport's closed. Uh, and the fire is just on the other side of the airport. That's about 10 kil uh, kilometers from where I am at the moment. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the fire's not yet under control. Uh, they're evacuating a couple of suburbs on the other side of the airport. Uh, but the sign I'm on is okay uh, given the wind direction. Unfortunately, about two hours ago, we had a, a tragedy associated with that. One of the, the big aircraft that uh, flies up with big tanks of water and, and bombs water onto the, um, the, the forest, it crashed into the mountains just outside of Canberra, and three people were, were unfortunately killed in that, that accident. Uh, that was about two hours ago. So things are, are a, little bit, uh, a little bit crazy around Canberra just at the moment. So, um, but that's an example of what the Anthropocene is actually like. Uh, the fires we're seeing around Australia, around Canberra, uh, even though we're a fire from landscape, we've never seen anything close to the uh, intensity or the, the huge area that's been burnt, uh, and the fires are still going on. So this is an example of, of when you start destabilizing big parts of the Earth's system, uh, you have problems. But let's go on now with the science of the Earth's system. Uh, and the whole, the whole point here is, is that our framework is that we look at the Earth as a single system. A lot of people say Earth systems with an S on it in English, but that's not correct. It's a single system, as you can see with this uh, picture from the Apollo spacecraft. This is way back in 1972, the blue marble image. But we have, we have good scientific evidence as to how our, our single Earth system operates. Uh, we can go down to Antarctica and drill uh, a very long ice course deep down through a couple of kilometers of ice. Uh, and layer by the layer, we can piece together the way the Earth is actually operating. So this red, uh, the, this red graph here I'm showing you is actually the temperature of the Earth. And it goes back a little over 400,000 years. So that's a very long time. And on that, we can map uh, the, the complete history of us humans. So we evolved about 200,000 years ago in Africa. We were hunter-gatherers mostly until about the last 10,000 years when we developed agriculture. But the point I want to make here is that this graph shows uh, systemic properties of the Earth as a single system. Notice the very regular pattern of, of long ice ages that are very cold and very short warm periods in between. They occur about every 100,000 years. But notice also how the, Earth, the Earth's temperature is capped at the bottom. The ice ages never get about four degrees below a warm period uh, and so on. So, uh, and you'll see on the right hand side the temperature is actually double that because that's because it's at the pole. The Earth's average temperature is about half of what we measure at the pole. So you see on that graph about a 10 degree uh, difference between a warm period uh, and, a, and, a, and a cold period, actually about an 8 degree difference. So that translates to about 4 degrees. Uh, as an average over the planet. This is the last 100,000 years uh, blown up, so we can see it in more detail. So you see the last ice age uh, getting colder and colder and colder until it reached its maximum cold period about 20,000 years ago. And then it took only about 8,000 years to come into the, the most recent warm period, the Holocene, and that's the one we're in. And so you can see that although there's some variability in the Holocene, it's a, it's a very stable, well-defined state uh, compared to an ice age. And this is the really good state of the Earth system for humans. Uh, when we entered the Holocene, we still hadn't invented agriculture. We were very small in, in numbers. Uh, and since then, of course, we've really expanded. But the whole idea of the Anthropocene is that we have actually left the Holocene. Due to human activities, we've now uh, started to destabilize the Earth system. So when we were studying this as part of the IPVP, which was which was mentioned in the in the introduction in this program, 
we started to see lots of evidence that things were changing outside of the, 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 the normal pattern of the Holocene. And this was our paleo scientists who were starting to say, well, things are, are changing. So we decided it as part of a 10 year synthesis around uh, the year 2000 that we should look at this more systematically. So the first thing we did was look at us humans and what characterizes humans. So we, we looked at basically 12 parameters that we could use to look at how human society, socioeconomic systems had changed. So it's obviously population, it's economy, it's foreign direct investment. On the second row in the middle, it's energy use. Uh, and then we looked at some resource use like fertilizer, uh, dams, so it's water resources, water use. Uh, and then we looked at the bottom at transport and communication and so on. And we didn't, we didn't expect to see what actually came out. We expected to see from 1750, which is where these graphs started, that the Industrial Revolution, which began in England in the late 1700s, that that would be a fairly smooth curve from about 1800 to the present. But in fact, it doesn't show that at all. It shows some increase in population, economy, energy use, and so on. But really, about the mid-20th century, um, the entire human system took off. So there's more people, population goes up, but even more dramatic, our economy really expands, energy use expands, resource use expands, and then there are dramatic changes in transport, and particularly in telecommunications since about 1990 or 2000 with the digital revolution, and so on. So we looked at that and said, that's pretty amazing. Um, and, and a little bit later, historians started using the word the great acceleration to describe that post-1950 uh, ex uh, explosion in human activity. But being we're system scientists, we asked ourselves, this is all very interesting, but can we see any impact of all this human activity on the Earth system? So what we decided we should do is do another 12 graphs from 1750 uh, to 2000. This, this, these versions I'm showing you have been updated to 2010. So we said, well, how can we define the Earth system in just 12 graphs? And so this is what we did. The top six of these 12 are what we call the geosphere. That's the non-living part of Earth. So it's the uh, gases in the atmosphere, it's the ozone layer, it's the climate system, and it's the ocean physics and chemistry. The bottom six are the biosphere, so it's again the ocean, uh, the coastal zone, and the land. So what we see in these 12, and we see the famous greenhouse gases at the top, the second row in the middle is actually is climate change, ocean acidification, and then we see how we've changed the ocean through fishing, um, so it's marine fish capture, coastal zone, aquaculture, nitrogen moving through the coast, and then how we've removed tropical forest, how we've domesticated land, that is, turned wild land into agriculture and, and settlements, uh, and then how we've uh, degraded the terrestrial biosphere in general. Now what you see in all 12 of these is strong changes toward increasing disruption of the natural part of the Earth's system. Uh, and you see, again, a lot of these correlate reasonably well, but not perfectly with 1950. And you may say, well, not, why not perfectly? Because there's resilience in parts of the Earth's system which gives lag effects and so on. Anyway, there are two things that when we analyzed all of these, two things we could say for certain. One is that this is outside of the Holocene envelope of variability. None of these graphs are what you would see if you go through the 11,700 year record of the Holocene. And the second thing we can say is all 12 of these the major driver in all 12 is human activity. It's not natural variability in the Earth system. So there's a massive amount of research and evidence for those two statements, uh, that a lot of which came out of the IGDP. So when, when we were looking at this data, before we'd actually crafted these graphs, but we're analyzing the data, it was this gentleman from the Netherlands, Paul Crutzen, who was on the scientific committee. He was the vice chairman of IGDP. And when we were presenting this data at a meeting in February in 2000 um, in Mexico, in Cuernavaca, Mexico, uh, Paul was, was listening to the data, he was looking at the drafts going up, and he was hearing the paleo scientists refer all the time to the Holocene, because of course that's the geological epoch we're in. And finally Paul got fed up with all this, 
and said, hey, wait a minute, we're not in the Holocene anymore, we're in the, and he was thinking of a word, and that's where the word Anthropocene came out. So he, um, a couple uh, months later, he published his thinking on this uh, in the IGDP newsletter, which appeared in May 2000, and you'll see a second name on that. Uh, and um, after that meeting, Paul Critson uh, came to me, I was working pretty closely with Paul at that time, and said, you know, this word Anthropocene, he said, it seems so obvious. I must not be the first patient person who actually used it. So he actually did a lot of research and he found that an American limnologist, a person who studies freshwater ecosystems, named Eugene Stormer, had used the term back in the 1980s. Uh, but he didn't refer to it, uh, to the Earth system as a whole, only to human impact on lakes. So he agreed to be a co-author of the paper, but he was not interested in pursuing the term any further. So that's why the term is so closely associated with Paul Critzen. Mm -hmm. So after this Anthropocene idea became much more widespread, National Geographic decided to do a, an article on it. And so they wanted to visualize what the great acceleration really looked like. So we used, and I was a consultant on this, so we used this famous IPAC equations that the impact uh, of, of, of humans is some combination of a population, how many we are, affluence, how much we consume, technology, what we use. So, the, so the, uh, uh, National Geographic made this into a box. And you can see on this box that it has three axes. The vertical one is affluence or consumption. The one going off to the left is population, just numbers of humans. The one on the right is technology, which is number of patent applications. So you can see, uh, if you go right into the bottom corner of that box, you see a little box there it says 1900. You can hardly see it. So that was the size of the box of humanity and its impacts in 1900. The entire box is 2011. So you see how huge it is. So that was the original picture. And I wrote back and said, you've missed the story. You haven't put in 1950. So they argued that say, well, that would only be halfway up. And said, no, it's not. It's not halfway up. So finally they put in 1950. That's the second little box down at the bottom. So from 1900 to 1950, there was not a big change in humanity's impact on the volume of the box. But from 1950 to 2011, there was an explosion of activity. So that really, in a picture, is the great acceleration. So you see that box is filled with stuff that we consume. There are boats, airplanes, refrigerators, cars, all sorts of stuff that fills this box. So that, in, in a visual way, is the great acceleration. So we can go back now and, and, and look at something that we're all interested in, climate change. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about climate change, but I will put it in the Earth system perspective. So here's a measure of Earth's average surface temperature. Uh, at the surface of the Earth in the atmosphere. So it goes back to 1880 and up to 20, um, nearly 2020. And you can see that there's a very sharp increase in temperature, particularly after about 1950 or 1960. Temperature really takes off. If we look at fossil fuels and land use change, they are the source of carbon dioxide, which is the major factor driving uh, climate change. Again, you see from about 1950, an enormous increase in fossil fuel uh, and industrial emissions, not so much in land use. That's pretty much steady from 1900 all the way through uh, to 2020. So if you look at the shape of that curve of fossil fuels and land use, and I go back and show temperature, you see the shape is very similar. And of course, the basic physics tells you they must be related. Uh, and so the, the relationship is through what's called the greenhouse effect. So these emissions of greenhouse gases, primary, primarily CO2, they stay in the lower atmosphere called the troposphere. And because they have this capacity to trap heat, they, they warm the Earth's surface. So the sun, um, the radiation of the sun comes through these uh, gases unimpeded, and it warms the Earth's surface. But the Earth releases heat back to the atmosphere, so we stay in balance, energy balance. Otherwise, the Earth wouldn't have burned up long ago. But with this extra thick layer of gases on the right-hand side of this figure, it actually traps more heat. Some of this heat actually gets re-radiated back down to the Earth's surface, and it warms the surface further. So this is what's called the enhanced greenhouse effect. 
It's act, it was actually first proposed by a French mathematician named uh, Joseph Fourier uh, back nearly two centuries ago. Uh, the first experimental evidence came from an amateur American scientist named Eunice Foote, who in the 1850s, she was the first one to actually put some CO2 in a gas and irradiate it with the radiation, same one like the sea, and lo and behold, it absorbed the heat and re radiated. So we know this really, really well. So, but we want to put this now in an Earth system context. So there's our uh, instrumental record from 1880 of, uh, of uh, rising temperature. But now what I want to do is put it on a 2,000 year record. So this is the last 2,000 years of the Holocene. And uh, you can see the temperature does have natural variability. And it's going to undergoing an extremely slow cooling trend. In fact, that cooling trend goes back to about 7,000 years ago. But from 2,000 years ago, it's only cooled by maybe one-tenth of one degree Celsius. That spike at the end I've circled called human influence, that is that instrumental record put on the same time frame as this 2,000-year record. So immediately you look at this, you can see how dramatic the human influence has been. It's been an extremely rapid increase in temperature, and it's a huge increase compared to natural variability uh, over uh, the last 2,000 years, way beyond the envelope of natural variability. So when you look at that, uh, that temperature rise uh, driven by greenhouse gas emissions, the great acceleration, that's what it looks like uh, from an Earth system perspective. When you look at the rates of change, again, they're quite dramatic. The rate of uh, increase of CO2 over the past two decades, um, uh, where it's really shot up, is about 100 times faster during the, during the uh, deep glaciation, which is from 20,000 to 12,000 years ago. So we're putting in CO2 at 100 times, two orders of magnitude faster than the Earth does at its most rapid increase. Now for half a century, 1970 to 2020, the global average temperature has risen at a rate that's about 170 times faster than the background rate over the past 1,000 years. And that, as I said, was a slight cooling uh, change. So again, when you look at this from an Earth system pr perspective, this is an incredibly dramatic change in the climate system. But of course, the climate system is a pretty good indicator for what we call the geosphere, the non-living part of the Earth system. But of course, the biosphere, the living part, is exceptionally important. In fact, the two are intimately linked through many cycles and interactions. In fact, they form the Earth system itself. So humans, what are we doing to the biosphere? In addition, obviously, to climate change, which is affecting the biosphere. But first of all, as you can see in this image, we're, tra we're transforming a lot of the biosphere from natural ecosystems to heavily managed human systems. But a good way of actually quantifying our impact is some data from Vaclav Smil, uh, a Canadian scientist. If we look now at the maps of all living creatures on the land that have a backbone, in other words, vertebrates, that's mammals, it's birds, it's reptiles, it's amphibians, and we add up their mass all together, we humans are 30% of that mass. But our domesticates, our pigs, our chickens, our beef cattle, our horses, and so on, they are two-thirds, they're 67%. When you add those two together, that's humans and our creatures that we maintain through agriculture, that leaves only 3% for all the wildlife on planet Earth on land. That's elephants, it's giraffes, it's uh, wild creatures in Europe, Australia, it's kangaroos, and so on. So we humans totally dominate the vertebrate <coughs> biomass on planet Earth on land. That gives you an idea of how much we've all spawned the biosphere. There's been a report that came out last year, a very thorough assessment of the entire biosphere, land, marine, coastal zone, plants, animals, all the living part of planet Earth that we depend on, of course, uh, for maintaining a habitable planet. Their conclusions are quite dramatic. Nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. Around one million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. So we're heading into the Earth's sixth great extinction event. The web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed. So this is what the Anthropocene looks like in terms of what's happening with the biosphere. 
I put this in because to me this is the best cartoon of what's actually going on. It came from Le Monde, which you're very familiar with in France, um, a few years ago. And so what it shows is the fact that we humans have made enormous progress. We're eating better, we're living longer, and so on. And you see uh, there's a human there with just uh, yawning after having a very good meal. But if you look at the background, we're eating into planet Earth. We're destabilizing, uh, degrading our own planetary life support system. So really, this is what the Anthropocene is all about. We are undermining our own life support system. And all those indicators I showed you in those 12 graphs of the Earth system shows the instabilities, the undermining of the system due to human activities. Of course, the word Anthropocene that Paul used, Paul Critzen, back in the year 2000, that's actually a geological term. And Paul actually did propose it as a new geological epoch in Earth's Earth history. But we Earth system scientists aren't the right people to actually judge whether it is or isn't a new epoch in Earth history. That's up to the geological community and more particularly the stratigraphic community. So there is a formalization process underway now. In fact, it's reached a critical point. Uh, the Anthropocene Working Group, chaired by Jan Zalasevic, has worked now for a decade and it's analyzed all the Earth system data, but a growing amount of stratigraphic data. In other words, drilling cores into the Earth and seeing, can we see the Anthropocene in these cores? And the group, which is comprised of 34 scientists, was asked a year ago, should the Anthropocene be formalized in the geological time scale, and should the base, the beginning, the start date, be placed around the mid-20th century, beginning of the Great Acceleration? The answer was yes, by 29 to 4. In other words, an overwhelming majority of experts have said, yes, the Anthropocene is real geologically, and it should be formalized. Now, there are more committees that need to approve this, and that's not guaranteed, so we have to wait another couple of years to see what actually happens. These are some of the indicators that we might use. What's showing up in the core in, in lakes, in land sediments, ocean, coastal sediments, aluminium, concrete, plastics, synthetic fibers, and there you see them sweeping up from 1950 to enormous quantities uh, here in the 21st century. So yes, we can see the imprint of the Anthropocene in the geological record as it's being formed. So that's the science and the geological side of the Anthropocene. So getting back to this idea of the Earth system, and now we're getting more into the uh, areas that are relevant for international law. That is, the Earth system is not just the geosphere, the climate system, and the biosphere. It's now the humans, the anthropocene, us, in our systems. Because we have become so large, so dominant, that we are a third major sphere of how the Earth system operates. So now I'll switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about the human system. So the first thing that we were challenged when we published these 12 graphs of the human system, we were challenged by, by some political scientists, and two Swedish political scientists, who said, wait a minute, the Anthropocene is not caused by humanity in general. It's caused by a subset of humanity, the wealthy people who live in the OECD countries and who produce so much and consume so much. They're really the ones responsible. And so we were challenged to examine this, and so we went back to our 12 graphs, and we decided to split the humanity part up into the OECD, that's the darker orange color, the wealthy countries, the emerging economies, which are Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and then the poor countries, which are the light shaded countries there. We could get data for 10 out of 12 of our indicators, and there you see them. But you only have to look at the two in the upper left. Population, since uh, 1950, most of the population added to humanity has been in the BRICS and the poorer countries, very little in our countries, in the wealthy uh, European, North American, Australian, New Zealand countries. But look at the real GDP, global domestic, uh, gross domestic product. That's a good uh, indicator for consumption. 75% of the com consumption still goes on in the wealthy countries. 18% of the population uh, actually accounts for 74% of consumption. So the two Swedish political scientists were correct. There are huge inequalities built into the Anthropocene. And we can see it right throughout in resource use, 
urban population, dams, and so on. Interestingly, though, in, in resource use, you start to see a, a leveling off in the wealthy countries and a very big increase, particularly in the uh, so-called BRICS countries. And that actually is a, 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 an indication of globalization, where the wealthy countries are now exporting a lot of the production of the things that we actually then consume back in the wealthy countries. So it's a very interesting story there, too. But if you look at income inequality, you can actually now split out the wealthy countries into two, the English-speaking countries on the left, Europe and Japan on the right. And this goes back to 1913, so you can see big inequality before the First World War. You can see the First World War, the Great Depression, uh, and then the Second World War uh, to the mid-20th century. And this basically reduced inequality uh, to much lower levels. It broke up the old feudal systems uh, of Europe and Japan. So these graphs, by the way, that percentage is the, the amount of total income of the country that goes to the top 1%. So you see back uh, in 1913, nearly 20% of the total income of countries was commandeered by 1%. That went all the way down to about 6%, 7% uh, mid 20th century. But look what happens then. If you look at the right, the modern European states in Japan have kept inequality at a much lower level. You can see the various countries. France is in red there. Uh, you can see other European countries, Sweden, Germany, uh, Japan's in there as well. But look at the English-speaking countries. What's happened to them since 1970 or 1980? They've become more unequal. In other words, the, the neoliberal economic system uh, that's really been driven by the U.S. has led to growing inequalities. It's just as bad in the U.S. now as it was uh, back in 1913. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that the best of the English-speaking world is actually Australia. Um, uh, but we're still not as good as the European countries, and we're going in the wrong direction. Well, you may say, why does this matter? Well, this is an interesting graph by two um, English epi epi epidemiologists, uh, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson. It's a very simple but absolutely profound graph. On the, on the vertical axis, you see um, an index of social he and health problems. You, you see what they are on the left, they're listed. Those are problems that occur in wealthy countries. So in other words, there is no um, intrinsic lack of resources to, 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 for everyone to have a good life. But then on the horizontal axis is income inequality, starting with low inequality all the way up to high. An incredibly strong correlation between inequality, inequality and bad social outcomes. So again, you see, uh, I think, an interesting trend the countries with the lowest income inequality are Japan and the Nordic countries. So you see Japan, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark. They actually have the best social outcomes in general. The worst countries tend to be the English-speaking countries, USA, UK, New Zealand, Australia, with the exception of Portugal, uh, which has large income inequality and bad social outcomes. And the mainstream European countries are sort of clustered in the middle. But this is telling us that we actually pay a price for inequality. And this leads to, I think, a broader issue in the, um, in the anthroposphere, in the human part of the Earth system. Is we are now starting to get what we call in Earth system science system incompatibilities. Not only are there incompatibilities within, within human systems in terms of bad social outcomes, income inequality, what humans are now doing, the direction we're taking with our societies and our um, uh, economies, our technologies, are leading to bigger and bigger incompatibilities with the rest of the Earth system. And they are they're expressed in terms of, of climate change, in terms of uh, biosphere degradation, and now they're starting to come back to bite humans in terms of uncontrollable fires. That image in the upper left is actually 2003 in Canberra, uh, when a bushfire came through Canberra and burned about 500 houses and so on. But now we're seeing really strange things on it, like the movement, uh, the anti-science movement, fake news is coming up, the war on science and so on. So there's really some very big incompatibilities, um, instabilities appearing in human systems. So that raises the question then, where is the Earth system actually going? So the last part of my talk will be sort of gazing into the future 
from an Earth System Science perspective to look at what could happen. So let's go back to our graph I showed you some minutes ago of the Earth System uh, in 2020, where the climate now has been rapidly destabilized from its long Holocene period of stability. But what I'm going to do now is take the climate model projections of the IPCC, where now we go out to 2100 with the low emission scenarios in blue, high emission scenarios in red. But that time scale is only two centuries, 1900 to 2100. What happens if we put these projections anywhere from um, uh, a bit over a degree up to 40 degree temperature rise on the same time frame, on a 2000 year time frame? So we're going to put it on that time frame. So 2100 is only a little bit further out on the right. That's what it looks like. So you can see from an Earth system perspective what an enormous, enormous change this is. So you see the Paris targets there of 1 to 1.5. See if I can, yeah, I can probably hear, see it on my cursor. Just in this, in this area here, 1.5 to 2. But right now we're on track for somewhere around 3 by 2100. So you can see what an enormous, enormous stress impact, an enormous hit this is on the Earth system and particularly on the biosphere. So we are pretty much committed to somewhere between 1.5 and 2. That's the best we can hope for. That's what the Paris Agreement would give us. But if we really uh, uh, increase emissions or keep them at very high levels, we could go to 3 degrees or perhaps even 4. And that's a completely different state of your system. It's a severe challenge to, to contemporary civilization and so on. But what I want to talk about now is this area in between between 2 and 4, or perhaps even as low as 1.5 and 4, because this is a zone in which the Earth system itself may take control. So even if we get our emissions down, we may have problems because of tipping points. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about tipping points um, or tipping elements? We know what they look like, and we've studied them for a long time. They come in three types. They come, come in melting of ice sheets, West Antarctica, Greenland, Arctic sea ice, permafrost, they come in terms of circulation change, North Atlantic circulation, Indian monsoon, and so, and they come in loss of big biomes like the Amazon forest or boreal forest. So you see these are parts of the Earth system. They could be biomes, could be huge ice sheets, or it could be circulation systems. And what's happening is in each of these we see that they behave in a non-linear way. In other words, small pressures by humans can tip them over a tipping point and flip them to an entirely new state. In other words, there can be surprising, uh, unexpected changes uh, that may take the Earth system out of our control. So what, in fact, is happening here? Well, we can already see three years in a row of drought. Uh, I should say three years in the last decade of drought, which is leading to increasing instability and fires in the Amazon. We're starting to see thawing of the permafrost in Siberia, fortunately just a little bit now, but that could accelerate. Arctic sea ice, decade by decade, that's getting uh, less and less in the in the <coughs> hemisphere summer, increasing the warming there, absorbing more sunlight. Coral reefs, mass bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef, they may have already crossed the tipping point, and we may be uh, committed to losing virtually all coral reefs around planet Earth. Greenland ice sheet, it's melting at an increasing rate, West Antarctica, that's starting to melt too. So we're seeing changes in quite a few of these tipping points already at a one degree temperature rise. And of course the Amazon is actually damaged in a second way by Cuban deforestation, which is now increasing with the change of government in Brazil. But the interesting thing is that these tipping points do not act in isolation. They are connected to one another. And we know what some of these connections look like. We've drawn them in this graph in terms of arrows connecting uh, various ones. You can think of it like a row of dominoes. When you st uh, stand dominoes on end and you put them in a row, if you tip the first one or two, then they start knocking the others down, and you can go all the way through the dominoes and knock them down. So this is really the concern we have here, is that several of these tipping elements, particularly big ones at the poles, are vulnerable at one to three degree temperature loss. We're already a little bit over one, and we're seeing instabilities. But the problem is, even within the Paris targets, we could tip several of these light yellow tipping elements, which could then, like dominoes, tip some of these ones in the three to five degree range, which are down toward the equator, and then they could tip 
some of the more, more um, robust tipping elements back um, back into the poles. So you can get the, the, this pole equation or pole steady of falling on them. The bottom line here is that the Earth system could get out of our control. So what we did is we published this uh, uh, this idea of this, this domino, this tipping cascade, um, as a landscape, so the stability landscape. So what we're trying to say here, oops, uh, but one too, one too far, is that the Earth normally stays back up here. So before the Great Acceleration, before the Anthropocene, the Earth would spend a lot of time in a cold ice age, which is down in this valley. It would come up into this little, nice little valley that's good for humans. There's the Holocene. But as we've pushed the Earth further away from Holocene conditions, as we move further into the Anthropocene, what we're doing is we're actually moving the Earth away from this system that's operated for well over a million years. And we're putting it out into sort of a new Earth system space, a new landscape. And notice that it's very shallow. It might be a valley, but it's, it's not very well defined. And that's because the Earth system itself is not very stable. But we are pushing it further and further away from the Holocene. And so what biosphere degradation and human emissions are doing are starting to activate these <coughs> tipping points. And so we've drawn these tipping points, this cascade is what we call a planetary threshold. It's sort of like a cliff. So we have this much hotter valley emerging in Earth system space. We're pushing the Earth into it. Uh, and we're still sort of in control, at least now we may still have a choice with Earth system stewardship. And this is where Earth system law comes in. It's because we need a guidance system to guide the Earth on a pathway to what we call stabilized Earth, which is another little valley away from an ice age. It's a little bit harder than our whole estate, but with human stewardship, i.e. with with Earth system law that can actually help steer the Earth system toward the stabilizer, we can perhaps avoid going over this cliff into this really disastrous state, which we call hot house Earth. That's five degrees or so warmer. It's a really difficult place for humans to live. It could well lead to collapse of, of uh, modern civilization. So this is what's at stake. Here's where the Earth system is going. Again, it's human pressure. This is not natural. Uh, changes that are pushing the Earth off toward this, this cliff that in the hot house Earth. And time is running out. So we really need to work fast to make sure we're on this sort of pathway, the pathway leading us to stabilized Earth. What happens if we get into hot house Earth? We don't think it's going to be very habitable at all. Most of the tropics and subtropics will simply be too hot for humans to live. Temperature obviously will change, rainfall patterns will change, and will likely make many large agricultural zones, the Mediterranean, Northeast China, Central USA, they will become less productive. Sea level, sea level will ultimately be 20 to 40 meters higher, and it will drown many of the coastal cities around the world, and many agricultural areas as well. There's been one estimate uh, by an Earth system scientist, the maximum carrying capacity could be one billion humans, not today's population of seven and a half or more. Basically, the bottom line is, this is not a state of the Earth system that you would ever want to live in. Well, we've developed things called planetary boundaries, which help us try to uh, guide humans. And again, uh, we've done a lot of work with planetary boundaries with this Earth system law context, uh, with Paolo Maguelas and, and, and other uh, international legal experts to say, this could be a good template, a good framework for defining what is a habitable state in the Earth system. So there are nine processes here, climate change, um, biosphere, so these are the two big ones, climate, biosphere, but then some more specific ones, land system, fresh water use, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, acidity in the ocean, uh, pollution in the atmosphere, and so on. And this green zone in between is the whole upholding space for humanity. This is what would define our common home in a well-functioning, stable, safe state. The wedges that we've drawn here is where we are today in 2020. We're in the red zone for biosphere integrity or phosphorus. We're in the danger zone, going to zone of high risk for climate, land system change, and so on. 
So this, if you like, is a guidance system for how we define the state property space and how we define it and where we are compared to it. Another way of looking at it is this one. So here's our safe space, uncertainty zone, high risk zone. The Earth is going this way. The planetary boundaries are designed to move us here. But of course, to operationalize planetary boundaries, that's a scientific framework. We need something that embeds that into human governance systems. And again, that's where Earth system law is so important. So if we go back to this graph, there's our Ice Age Holocene uh, oscillation. There's our spike here, the temperature spike. Here's where we are today. We've moved the Earth out of this stable state, which is back here. There's our tipping cascade. There's our threshold. There are the planetary boundaries. They are defined what we call stabilized Earth. So here again is the challenge is getting onto this pathway. We know what a stabilized Earth looks like, but we are going in the wrong direction. That's why we need a, a change. I'm going to close now with, with again, focusing on what probably the most uh, important near-term issue, which is stabilizing the climate system. Uh, we're obviously in a climate emergency. The science is saying that. Uh, but uh, the young people are picking up, picking that up. Here's Connecticut Thunberg, the Swedish student. Um, and here's what she says, you have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. People are suffering, people are dying. Uh, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We see that in Australia now. Entire forced ecosystems that have never burned uh, in Australia before are being completely wiped out by these fires. They are collapsed. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and again, even in Australia, even in the worst of the fires, all our federal government can talk about is money and economic growth. And so she's calling them out and saying, we've got to stop this. There's some scholars, though, who've done some really nice work. These are our two scholars, uh, Capra and Louise, who have published a beautiful book on the system's view of life, starting with the very origins of life all the way up to the Earth system and human system. Beautiful book, can highly recommend it. They have a very strong comment. Our world today is dominated by a global economic system with disastrous social and environmental impacts. They call it predatory capitalism. And they know we are the only species on Earth, the only one that has ever existed on Earth, that knowingly destroys its own habitat. And of course, it threatens countless other species with extinction in the process. There are some solutions out there. Kate Rayworth from Oxford University in the UK has developed this idea of donut economics where we need where we can define a safe and just operating space for humanity so here's the social foundation we need education income gender equality energy jobs food water we need this to thrive as humans but we need to respect our environmental uh, ceiling here are the nine planetary boundaries so the space in between she calls the donut and that's where we need to operate but we, again, we don't have a guidance system to operate there. We are breaking out of our environmental ceiling. Again, this is why we need Earth system law, international law, to help define and legalize and recognize this safe operating space for humanity. So she has seven guidelines. I put six, uh, three that are really, really important. We need systems thinking, dynamic complexity. That's what Earth system science is all about. We need equity. Our new economic system must distribute by design, not after the fact. And it must regenerate the biosphere. We need to get rid of the word resources, ban it from the use of the English language and translations into other languages. We need to have words that say we must treasure, value, and regenerate the biosphere and develop an economy that only works when we maintain the biosphere in a well-functioning state. Philosophers have gotten in. Now, this is Dipas Chakrabarty. He says, look, our 20th and 21st century societies, they're human-centric. It's all about us humans. But what we need are life-centric countries, uh, uh, life-centric value systems and economies. So the Anthropocene demands this zone-centric or life-centric approach. I'm going to give the last word of my talk to the people in Australia. They are the longest continuous living culture on planet Earth. So they've been in heaven in Australia for about 65,000 years, and they've been stupid in this, stupid to this continent for almost all of that time, until the last 200 or so years when Europeans have come in. 
I really have some words of wisdom for us. These are some words from an elder from uh, uh, people in Western Australia, the new our people. They say we're only here for a short amount of time to do what we've been put here to do, which is to look after country. We're only a tool in the cycle of things. Notice they understood the system, cycles. We go out into the world and help keep the balance of nature. Notice balance. Again, that's an earth system concept. It's a big cycle of living with the land and then eventually going back to it. So early humans have actually understood what limits were about. They understood what stewardship was about. They understood the earth system and they lived within the limits of the earth system. So that's our challenge in contemporary society. We've got to sort of re, reattach ourselves to what our ancestors actually knew. So that's our challenge. We don't have much time to do it. We're going in a bad direction. We need every tool we can get. Uh, and, and that's pers my personal comment here is that's why I was so attracted to the idea of international law, of a legal framework that actually recognized not just territories, not just the physical earth, but recognize the intangible earth system. Uh, that's, that's something very, very important for the future of humanity and every other form of life on earth. So I'm going to stop there uh, with, with this thought, where on earth are we going? Um, and uh, hopefully we have about 15 minutes, as you suggested, uh, to take some questions.